Uh, I'm your host today. My name is David Beres, I'm a project manager at Arc Research uh, Engineering Company. Uh, we specialize in everything related from infrastructure projects to R&D in thermal energy storage or the application in thermal energy storage for buildings and the industry. Uh, our session today has six different presentations. This is split in two main uh, sets of uh, times with a short break in the middle. Um, uh, basically, it deals with one of the, let's say, together, two of the biggest source of energy demands in the, in the world right now, the industry and the building sector. And actually, we are proposing solutions for cooling and heating. Being cooling, one of, uh, forecasted as one of the most growing uh, energy demands of the recent future around the world. In this slide, we will see projects that deals about uh, solutions that are in line with climate change mitigation, solutions that are in line with energy efficiency, or solutions that are more efficient than traditional energy systems, uh, solutions that are a source of uh, energy security and independence, which is really important in the current times, uh, great, great important uh, in terms of advancement in health quality, uh, and of course, it's a source of economic benefit around the world and a job creation. And of course, in line with the long term sustainability goals that we have in Europe. Uh, well, without further ado, uh, we're going to start with uh, our first presentation in the project Heister. Uh, the presenter, uh, presentation will be made by Dr. Uh, Kian Ban. Kian is a senior researcher and a project leader at the KTH research facility uh, at Sweden. Um, he has been working in research for the last 10 years uh, in the field of HVAC, ICT control, energy efficiency, uh, coping uh, in sectors like uh, sector coping of buildings. And uh, he's really interested in ICT uh, solutions, BMN system, uh, integration of uh, energy networks, and different data driven uh, approaches. So, yeah, the floor is yours. I have to pass your slide. I can. You can try. No? no? Okay, I will pass it. Let me know. Let me know and I will pass you the slide. Okay, but it has to stay more or less where you are now. Because the, the camera? Shows okay, it. then I leave you. That's fine. There is one. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I will present a little bit our newly funded project, HiStore. It represents uh, the full name hybrid services from advanced thermal storage solutions. And uh, I will start to describe a little bit the project. Uh, actually, it's a newly funded project from this year. So the project just start for around five and a half months. And uh, in, in principle, this is an innovation action project. Uh, we have 18 partners from different countries, you can see from Europe. And uh, the aim of the project is to reach uh, seven. So actually we will show you a little bit our pilot side and uh, what we will do there. And actually we, our coordinator is David. <laughs> so, so if you have further questions, we'll be able to uh, answer you afterwards. So a little bit the focus of the project. In principle, the project focuses on thermal storage solutions, but the project is not just to develop materials or different thermal storage component itself. We're focusing on the system levels and how different thermal storage solutions can be integrated into buildings or communities and different energy networks in order to really scale up the thermal storage solutions. And also we want to provide a more holistic solutions that how different thermal storage can be connected with, for example, HVAC, connected with uh, district heating, connected with uh, local energy communities. So there are several aspects we want to put it together as a center of thermal storage. So what is the mission of high store? The high store mission we, we can summarize with one sentence to develop and validate 
for innovative sets of thermal energy storage concept. And this concept we will show you a little bit later. But in principle, it's based on, for example, PCM, phase change materials, TCM. Uh, and the application can be for heating, cooling, domestic hot, domestic hot water, and other hybrid services. So, uh, one of the challenges of our current uh, thermal storage system is that how you can scale up and how you can really take advantage of thermal storage to unlock the flexibilities for different energy networks from building side, HVAC, to the grid. So this is the starting point of our project and a little bit of framework uh, of the concept of high school. For instance, we have a local thermal, thermal storage connected to the building site and how we can really connect different thermal storage from short-term storage to long-term storage and connect it with controllers and aggregate them in regardless it's multiple buildings or one single building into a community level and we want to evaluate how this can really contribute to the grid for example to reduce the pressure from the uh, from power grid and make uh, uh, benefits instead of installing say batteries so uh, a nutshell of the project you can see here we have different say four major concepts of thermal storage solutions we're going to focus on and this whole thermal storage solutions will be integrated with the state-of-the-art HVAC system regardless if it's convective heating or radiant heating so we want to integrate the thermal storage with the building thermal, thermal uh, storage capacities optimize it and connect it with aggregators and these aggregators can act as a joint point both for the building itself or multiple buildings, as we said, and the data will be stored, processed, and optimized on a platform we develop ourselves, which will be open platform. So everyone, third party APIs can be connected. And uh, we have in general five pillars of the project. One is the first pillar is very much focusing on the component of the thermal storage itself. For example, the materials, the heat exchangers, configurations of different storage solutions component. The second pillar is about control and management of the thermal storage. This means that not only the controllers in low level for the thermal, thermal storage, but also the uh, integration with BMS systems and aggregators. Then the third pillar is about uh, multi-level integrations. This means that we want to test on um, building side, but also say a building district or cluster scale to, uh, to, to validate. And the last one is about exploitation, business model and value chain creation, including new business models, how we can utilize thermal storage to contribute to the grid and contribute different standards and policy development in the future with respect to thermal storage. So I will go a little uh, into a little de in details about the uh, thermal storage concepts. Basically, we have four types of thermal storage will be on focus. The first one is called only one PCF. So this is basically apartment level uh, or apartment scale uh, PCM storage so solutions uh, integrated with heat pumps. So this can be uh, used uh, either as a unit or several multi-agent system as a storage solution for one building, like one apartment. And we are trying to find uh, more, say, uh, green solutions when it comes to refrigerants and with lower global warming potential. And this part is mostly developed by our Austrian partners. The second one is a PCM heating solution. This part is mostly developed by KDH, and we already have a lab hit testing for this solution uh, uh, so so the, the point here is that how we can scale up the existing solutions to building level or building or building cluster levels uh, and we want to make the thermal storage which means uh, the tank and the heat pump as a modular solution yeah and uh, we have the living lab to test the full scale the third one is about uh, pcm low temperature solutions and also we want to uh, promote more modular design for the heat pump and use different materials for the heat exchanger instead of stainless steel 
we want to promote, for example, polymer and uh, uh, and, and also bio-based uh, raw materials in order to reduce not only the operational phase but the overall uh, thermal storage uh, uh, impact to the emissions from the material side. The last one is about TCM, thermal chemical, thermal chemical storage, and uh, this can be used for both heating and cooling. And uh, this is mostly developed by our Italian partners who have been in this uh, research area for a decade. Then the last one is a little bit stay, uh, added value that we want to uh, uh, develop more, say, smart uh, state of charge algorithm to see that how different say, data driven methods can be used to predict and, uh, uh, and control the low level of storage, for example, using machine learning techniques and uh, select the key parameters, we can scale up the current solution to other uh, buildings or climates. So this is a bit the storage part, but, also, uh, but for this project, we, as we mentioned, we don't really want to only focus on the component of the thermal storage itself, but also the, uh, the integration, the control, and the whole energy network aspect. In this respect, we have, uh, say, four different type of innovations or uh, ICT solutions we have been um, integrated. The first one is about ontology, and, and we want to use an established uh, standard for ontology like Saref to see if IoT-based ontology can be implemented and how this can be scaled up uh, based on, as we said, standard ontology framework. The second one is about the interoperability. Uh, we have our partner, for example, Stan is there, and they are managing the energy assets, how you can store the data, do the predictions, have optimization of different data sets when they collect them with storage and put them in a process that can be more efficient with higher interoperabilities. And the third one, for example, is using uh, the potential of edge computing. For example, we want to promote federated learnings to see if we see the thermal storage in a bigger scale as multi-agent system, how we can prevent the data, how we can prevent, uh, how we can uh, promote more smart management of the, of the whole process, and also how we can really put the thermal storage in the, in the center to see what is the optimization method we can do when we have different type of state of charge different thermal, thermal response time of buildings and the network conditions, such as the grid. And the last one is a little bit hardware solutions for the aggregators. And we want to have both physical aggregators, which means that if your thermal storage is not working well or something is broken, you can physically cut uh, their influence to the grid. And also you can have softwares installed on it, for example, developed from the previous three to make sure the aggregator can operate the different thermal storage in the optimal way. Yeah, this is a little bit the ICT part. The last one is about the platform. So as you know that if you want to scale up thermal storage or if you look at from a, a higher level, we need to have always the view of systematic thinking that the, how these different solutions can be integrated and working as a whole. In this res respect, we have different the aspects I've been thinking. The first one is, for example, optimal planning tool. And this planning tool is, uh, uh, is going to be performed by our Italian partner. And uh, they have been thinking to mostly focus on one, we'll have a piece of heating. So how the thermal storage should be planned, dimensioned and sized into the existing piece heating networks. And the second one is about data management. Of course, this is always very important to make sure the data is the data we have and the data can be conserved, conserved well, we can use the data better. And the last one is the operating systems. This means that we need to develop some operating system for the, for the aggregators. And this makes sure that there's no data privacy issues. And also we can make sure the local grid conditions and status meet what we can get from the thermal storage. So you're not pro providing solutions that doesn't really fit into, for example, the power conditions in the local context. So a little bit uh, the architecture of the project. You can see that basically we have uh, four layers 
of architecture. The foundation is the high school ontology. This means that how the data can be more interoperable. And with different manufacturers, with different, uh, say, providers of the HVAC solutions and thermal storage. Then built on this, we have different pilots. We have also different status for the hardwares. And we have a little bit controllers and different IoT devices. How the uh, data can be collected from the thermal storage device itself and sent to two pathways. One is, for example, use more edge solutions. So this optimization will be processed and, and decision making can be done on the edge on site and otherwise, of course, to the cloud. So we can, we can have both ways uh, to, to find which one is the best, given the condition of the pilot. A little bit of impact. Uh, we have four major impacts we want to achieve. One is 120% energy density. This is ambitious. We will see if we can do it. And the second one is 50% uh, of KPEX uh, for thermal storage. And uh, the third one is about insulation because uh, the, we have met problems for innovations or different solutions. This installing it is a problem. So we want to provide more, say, guidelines, uh, engineering uh, handbook for the people who are interested <coughs> in thermal storage in the future. And of course, as the alternative of batteries, which is much cheaper, of course. Then I will present a little bit the concept of our demonstration sites. So we basically have four uh, pilots across the different climates in Europe. Uh, the first one is in Sweden. Actually, it's a living lab in KDH. Uh, it's a cluster of uh, three ra rather large uh, dormitory for the students. So it's on the campus, so we can access uh, people, access uh, everything. And all the pilot has been installed with IoT sensors. This means that we'll, we can get real-time data. And there is already some storage there, and we will add a new thermal storage uh, for the building. So we will be able to build this solution on top of the existing buildings. And uh, we don't have district heating connected, so the solution will be thermal storage with heat pump. And the second one is in Austria. Uh, this, uh, this pilot is a residential building, and uh, the, the goal there is to install unit uh, scale uh, uh, all in one thermal storage to see if it's possible for apartment level storage and how we can aggregate it uh, in different ways to make sure this is really supporting the district heating network also can reduce the peak power. The third one is in Spain, in Montserrat. It's a historical building, I believe, and it's not just one building, it's a cluster of, um, of cultural heritage sites. Uh, we are still in the process to choose a place to install the thermal storage uh, because it's not easy. It's quite a big pilot. And the overall goal here, for example, is that uh, we have a lot of cooling need there, so we will see, if, for example, TCM can help and contribute the cooling, cooling uh, need from the grid. And the last one is uh, in Ireland, in Dublin. So it's a quite big, uh, uh, quite big campus of the whole university. And the university has a good privilege when it comes to energy system. They have CHP, biomass, and so many options uh, for, for the existing district heating network. It's like a micro grid uh, itself, uh, and it's quite good for us to install our solution, but also they have uh, recorded 12, 13 years of data from their current DMS system. So there are many, say, games we can play with. Uh, yeah, this is a little bit uh, our pilot situation. So when we have, in principle, both pilots that are living lab, we have real good data, and also a little bit pilot that is real market condition that we will need to work on it, uh, and with this repeating connected or not. So, quite different pilots. That's all from my side. Um, if, you're, if you like the project, welcome to follow us. Thanks a lot, yeah. So, the idea is to have the three presentations of the first session, then have a few questions around, and then go for the next session. But if somebody has a quick question right now, it will fit. No?
So our next, next presenter uh, is Juan Maro, I think. Second. Yeah, our next presenter is Juan Barro Lopez. He's uh, a project manager at Creara Energy uh, Experts. Uh, Juan graduated in, as a mechanical engineer in 2019 with a focus in renewable energy. Uh, and he complemented his background with a postgraduate course in business and strategy consultancy. Since he joined the company, he has been working in the fields of energy efficiency and renewable energy sources implementation. His main expertise is in district heating and coolies, specifically in the study and modeling of financial assessment aspects. He's responsible for the action heat project that is that he's presenting today. So I'll give you the floor. Uh, please stay over here for speaking. Thank you. Uh, well, today I'm going to present the action heat project. Um, basically, the presentation is structured. Um, in four uh, main sections. First, we have an introduction, basically about the the project itself, the partners, and so on. Then we have the methodology, the tools, um, the support provision. Um, we have some success stories afterwards, uh, based on the post code applications, and then we go out to the future outlook, just to solve the questions that were posed uh, for this. So first. Uh, Main things about the project, the objectives for it would be that strategic heating and cooling planning is further disseminated and taken up. Um, this is the main focus of the project. It focuses on providing a strategic heating and cooling uh, support for municipalities uh, all around Europe. Um, that the quality of this strategic and cooling planning is increased and that it leads to the implementation of the carbonization measures. Uh, to do this, we have a consortium of eight companies, well, seven actually. Um, which encompasses uh, the Center for Sustainable Energy, for example, from Offer, there's uh, technical institutes, also uh, the Technical University of Vienna, um, ICLE as a communication partner, and then Eclarian, Ethic, and Clara, which are um, consultancy companies uh, from the efficiency market. Um, main indicators for the project we have uh, 120 municipalities. That will yeah, the points change. So, well, basically, I'll tell you about it. So, 130 municipalities that will start, continue, or improve their strategic uh, heating and cooling, uh, encouraged by the support packages that we deliver. Uh, for the pre-feasibility studies that will be carried out uh, for individual projects in these municipalities, and then 15 uh, financing um, studies to say so that will be developed for uh, some of the pre-feasibility studies that we um, do. So then uh, this will be carried out through the support facility. Um, basically, while tutoring uh, in applying, we use two tools called thermos and home maps, which were developed in previous European projects. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more about them afterwards. Um, yeah, basically what we provide is uh, support and feedback on the mapping um, using these modeling tools. Also, we have a, a training and capacity building program based on, on the training materials developed previously uh, in these European projects and also on a, on a set of webinars that we are carrying out right now. Um, and then also one of the targets is enabling uh, policy and project implementation, basically through stakeholder dialogues, project events and the ambassador program. Now, we developed uh, one of the first things that uh, was done was developing this uh, heating and cooling workflow um, which tries to depict the planning process for heating and cooling interventions uh, since the beginning stages until the review report and upscale of the process. Uh, we identify three different areas uh, of intervention, which are basically policy, city planning, and execution. As you can see, there are two loops uh, the first one associated to city planning, and the second one to the project itself. Um, this is all available in the project's website. Um, with a more interactive approach where you can basically um, see the definition for each of these different sections. Um, and yeah, basically this is what we based uh, everything on the project. For the first loop, the one in red, um, it's more focused for the hot maps tool, which is more 
um, as an overview. And then for the blue one, we use the thermos tool, which I'll explain now um, because it's more specific for each project. Right, so now we go to the project part. So, as I already said, the support is delivered in three different areas that could fit into each other but could not also. So, you can apply either for strategic planning or for pre feasibility studies. Uh, you cannot apply for the financial analysis because we need a pre feasibility study. So, the, uh, the financial analysis are chosen from previous pre feasibility studies that we developed. Um, as I said, there are two simultaneous support facilities. You, you can either um, apply for each of them, but there's also uh, what we call the integrated use or, or the integrated methodology. And basically, you use some of the functionalities from PodMaps to feed some inputs into Thermos and be able to develop the, the inputs and the information that we need to run the tool. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, Thermos and PodMaps are the open source tool uh, developed in, pre in previous processes and that are used uh, basically to calculate all the results in the project. And also, um, interested parties can apply using the online application form available in the Action Kit website. So, this project does not work with pilots and replicators as others do. Um, we work on a um, call for applications basis. So, there's been three call for applications. Now, the, the third one of that one is ongoing. Um, and basically, uh, we developed a set of, of criteria, parameters, um, implemented them into a tool. So basically, uh, every time we get uh, an application, which uh, uh, application phase is open for periods of three months, we actually uh, automatically get it scored and, and assessed. Um, right, so um, now for the planning tools, well, this is the first one, which is hot maps. As you can see, uh, it has um, a more uh, high scale approach. Um, you can, I don't know if you can see it from there, but you can, you have some lines here depicting the different uh, areas that you can select. You can go from, uh, you have them over there, from nuts levels to also a hectare level. Um, this tool basically, the vision of the project, of the whole project was to motivate strategic heating uh, uh, energy planning for public body by facilitating the identification, analysis, modeling, and mapping of resources and technological solutions. So basically here you can assess, uh, you have two sides. So basically you have layers itself, or for example, you have uh, um, renewable energy potentials, you have demand layers, you have um, different uh, inputs, and then you have the calculation modules. Uh, which is where you can use that information contained in the layers to develop um, your own data sets. The objectives of the project were to develop an open source tool, provide initial data for uh, municipalities, and providing a uh, proven easy to use software. Basically, the results, as you can see, are uh, maps in GIS format of the characterized resource, which can be energy demand, potential for development of a heat network, biomass supply capacity uh, among a lot of them that you can see on the left hand thing. Then for the thermos project, um, it's uh, kind of the same approach. Uh, well, uh, this is a more specific approach uh, using uh, GIS. Basically, the vision for the project was uh, scaling up and accelerating the development of low carbon climate networks in Europe, allowing upgrades, innovations, and extensions to be considered quickly and easily. Um, yeah, the, the objective basically is to have a versatile tool that once you have implemented all the information onto, um, allows you to have different scenarios and to assess them in a, in a quick way. The objective, as I said, is mapping demands and generation alternatives for the whole street in, in, in the pilot series, establishing a methodology for local energy mapping applicable to the whole of the EU, and develop and implement algorithms for modeling and optimizing it. Um, the results is uh, an open source online tool that allows the modeling of big networks taking into account real costs, tariffs, performances, operation in a versatile and easy to use way. Um, basically, here uh, the idea is uh, for the tool to be, uh, as I said, as versatile as possible. It can be used uh, throughout Europe. Um, specifically, the, the supplies are only characterized on really standardized parameters, as KPEX, OPEX, you don't even have to set up the technology that you're using. Um, 
Yeah, and in the end, it provides information, uh, both economical and technical. So you have revenues, you have uh, capex and opex for the for the whole project. You can also annualize it, so on, which allows to assess everything on a more detailed way. But you also have information about the supplies, about the demands, um, the capacities, the energy generated, the energy consumed. You have also information about the piping, the lengths installed, the different diameters, because you can change um, the diameter of some of the piping. You can provide a whole catalog. Uh, you can change the civils uh, for the, the different pipes and so on. So yeah, basically, um, this is uh, the tool that we use to develop the visibility analysis. Okay, so the support provision, and I'll go over it a little bit quick. Uh, as I said, it goes through a call for application basis. Uh, there will be three separate calls. Uh, fourth is the design projects, the previous studies have five financial, financial analysis each. Um, we are on the third one because this is the third year of the project. Uh, uh, this will be the last one. Uh, participants will be accepted until the KPIs for each called are fulfilled. So the, the numbers that we see above. In case of the consortium resource exceeds uh, application will be accepted on the basis of a select, uh, selection criteria, as I already mentioned. And each participant will be assigned to a member of the consortium according to their geographical location to get this tailored support delivered. Actors that can uh, basically apply for support facility are uh, local and regional authorities, utilities, consultancies, energy agencies, uh, researchers, policy makers, whomever, basically. Um, okay, so now we go to the success stories, and here it's uh, interesting also to say that while uh, support facility number two covering the feasibility studies is really a lot more fixed, uh, support facility number one tries to adapt to the needs of the municipalities. So, hot maps is uh, really also versatile, but in another way. Um, and for example, they use it for LIA Hessen, uh, which is the energy agency in Hessen, Germany. Um, the heat planning here will be mandatory next year, so that's why they were interested in developing it. And the first uh, point of contact for the municipalities on heat planning, um, at least in Germany, tends to be the uh, LIA. So, three comprehensive workshops uh, were attended by numerous Hessian municipalities. Experts from the Action Heat Consortium gave keynote speeches. Also, we have targeted training webinars for the members of the energy agency, basically on topics like data for municipal heating and cooling planning, developing a data name network for heat planning, and using the HotMaps database on tools for strategic heating and cooling. So basically, uh, uh, we provide advice for a quick advisory service for district heating, and this includes the development also of a best practice slide, slide deck for renewable energy sources in district heating networks. So as you can see here, the support wasn't uh, something really um, hands-on. Basically, it was more of a training program, which uh, we can also deliver. Um, then we have Sensei, um, which is other of the case studies that we have. Uh, Sensei is a town in East Flanders in Belgium. Uh, sources of alerts among the residual heat nearby are available. And they already identified a potential economically viable heat network. So basically, what we help them with thermos. Uh, as a part of the support facility, facility, thermos has been used to answer the specific heat network related questions for the local government. Experts from the Action Heat Consortium have been meeting regularly because one of the um, most difficult parts of the, of the projects are the data gathering. Um, so basically, we have, uh, yeah meetings with various stakeholders on uh, building heat demands, driving costs, heat supply costs, and so on, and also to help them translate them. The output of the collaboration would be a feasibility study for the local government. Currently, initial results are being produced and discussed between the experts uh, of the construction. Uh, then the last one is the Macedonian Academy for of Sciences and Arts, which is a research center for sustainable development. And their objective was to set up a data inventory to assist Macedonian municipalities in their heating and cooling planning. So basically, here what we did is also using um, hot maps uh, to develop this data inventory. Currently uh, participating in targeted training webinars as a part of the action kit, 
um, these are the topics also, as we already mentioned, and experts uh, assisted them in the collection of the data to set up uh, the Hotmaps Toolbox for machine learning. So basically, the, the Hotmaps Toolbox uh, is available for all European countries, but it doesn't have the same information for all countries because it depends on the data sets that were developed uh, in, previous, in the previous project. So for example, here what we are doing is gathering all that data uh, for the Hotmaps Toolbox to be available in Macedonia. Um, yeah, and that also fits within the capabilities of support facility number one. Actually, here, actually we will also host a workshop uh, with Macedonian municipal, municipal authorities to show in detail how the toolbox works. So again, uh, some capacity. Um, but I think that, yeah, as for the future outlook, yeah, really, really general here. So how will we know about solutions uh, for buildings and industry techniques are really changing the future? So we think it will try to encompass both demand and supply uh, with heating and cooling as a whole, as we, I don't know if you were here for the previous um, uh, webinar, but basically uh, that's what we are discussing always in district heating, encompassing heating and cooling, and that's the, the challenge for the next generation. Aggregate demand also, and integrate, as we're discussing, renewable energy sources and, and waste heat into these networks. Um, then, which will be the role of renewable energy uh, we're not keeping our cooling solutions for buildings and industry in the future. Uh, as we said uh, previously, it's key on helping reach uh, EU's 250 goals uh, and then reduce overall demand, support the carbonization, and promote self consumption uh, at all. Um, and I think, yeah, with this, this will be all. Yeah, so if you have any questions or comments, I'll be able to answer them. Thanks, Juan. I think that you have pretty good interaction with the previous session. Yes. All the projects of the session are very, very Okay. Uh, we are really, really good on time. Our next speaker is Maria Fonti for NTUA. From NTUA. She's here. So a bit about Maria, uh, she's a professor at the Mechanical Engineering Department at NETUA at the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, she's the director of the laborat uh, laboratory of heterogeneous mixtures and combustion systems. She's uh, the coordinator of Plural, the ISA European project. Maria has been involved in several EU research for more than 30 years, and she has been working in the fields of energy efficiency in buildings Coupling passive with renewable and low carbon technologies. Okay. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so uh, we are moving to a different uh, direction. I'm going to briefly present the plural project, which, uh, as uh, you see from the title, it uh, targets uh, the integration of uh, renewable heating and uh, cooling sources uh, in uh, adaptable prefabricated facades that uh, can uh, help to renovate existing buildings to reach the net zero energy uh, standard. Oh, the other one. Sorry. Okay, plural, uh, it's a um, Horizon 2020 project. Now it's uh, uh, finishing its third year and uh, we are entering the, demo, the full scale demonstration. Um, uh, 18 partners from uh, seven countries. Overall uh, uh, budget for the project is of the order of uh, 9.5 million and the duration, as you can see, it's for four years. The key objective is to design, validate, and demonstrate a palette, a variety of prefabricated, uh, adaptable, scalable, off-site fully prefabricated facades that uh, can be used for different fitting of uh, buildings, reaching a zero energy consumption. Uh, the target is to demonstrate that this type of renovation is cost-effective, fast-track, environmentally friendlier, and last but not least, to develop a number of uh, uh, options for these uh, solutions to demonstrate flexibility and adaptability. Um, in the frame of the plural concept, and this is what I'm going to present to you 
Next, we have developed three, four, what we call PMU kits, plug and use. It's a paraphrase of plug and play. The use means that they take into account the user needs. Um, and they are called smart wall, connect wall, and then comfort. These three core systems are being demonstrated in three real and three virtual uh, demo sites. Accompanying the, the technical developments of these fabricated facades, we have a, a digital platform to support end users, designers, architects in the uh, selection of the proper solution, uh, prefabricated solution for the proper building, taking into account a number of key performance indicators that address technical, environmental, cost uh, parameters. And the platform that we have developed makes a hierarchy of the solutions uh, taking into account these uh, KPIs. Uh, furthermore, as part of the project, uh, we are looking at the uh, challenges to industrialize these uh, prefabricated solutions, which, as I said before, and I will show you in a minute, they integrate the passive, the materials, with renewable energy sources. And this is a big challenge for the manufacturers that normally are totally separate. For instance, you have the manufacturers of the fun coins on one side of the MEPS, uh, mechanical and electrical pumping systems, and on the other side, you have the manufacturers of the wall components. They don't collaborate normally, so it's a huge challenge to bring them together to produce industrially this type of uh, facade. Last but not least, like a training tools, life cycle assessment, life cycle costing for the uh, environmental um, impact assessment. This is a view of the three demo sites that we have. One is located in Greece, Mediterranean climate, where we will uh, install actually next week uh, for a full floor, a whole story, the smart wall. And the second one is in the Terrassa, Spain, a bit more in the north from here, where we will uh, install the Dell Comfort. And the third one is in the, in the Czech Republic, where we will uh, install the uh, Connex wall. And uh, as virtual demonstrators, we have three more buildings where we are doing all the design, all the uh, analysis, the energy assessment, the environmental assessment, the uh, decision making, but we are not actually producing uh, the, the, the kits. And one is in uh, Bern in Switzerland, the other one is in Berlin in Germany and in Sweden in Vespin. Uh, the methodology that we use is, first of all, to define the key performance indicators. Uh, quite difficult because, as I said, we combine passive with active uh, systems and solutions. Then the design, the development, the testing, the performance of these uh, uh, PAU kits. Uh, the, in parallel, we did the development of the decision support uh, tools. Then we went to manufacture, and now we are in the third year, uh, the fourth year of the project, uh, where we are going uh, to the full scale demonstration and the validation of the solutions. Um, these are the targets that we have per year. And uh, of course, now being the last year that we will start in September, our aim is through the monitoring campaigns to prove that we can reach the NZ status. Uh, to validate the manufacturing procedures and uh, to develop business models for the market update. This is an overview of the uh, technologies that we have developed, the three core technologies, which I will present in the next slides more in detail. Uh, I have included this slide here to show that uh, something that I will not analyze is, apart from the core technologies that I will show you, we have heat harvesting windows. These are uh, windows that uh, and uh, integrate in the space between the panes of the window uh, special coatings that increase the reflectance of the light and they have a heat exchanger uh, on the bottom as you can see the, uh, of the of the frame and the top so uh, you circulate the air and depending on the outside temperature you can support the heating or cooling of the space uh, through the ventilation in the window. Every 
uh, of the three kits that I will show you has uh, what we call a toolbox. It's all the automation system. Uh, the more advanced, which is actually incorporated in the prefabrication, is the one of the smart wall that includes an active uh, fire suppression system. It includes the control system for the fan coils uh, based on uh, measurements that are uh, taken for uh, temperature, humidity, uh, CO2, VOCs, um, and uh, visual comfort from the in inner state, of course. <laughs> uh, th these are more parameters that are actually needed for the control of the uh, uh, fan coils. And um, uh, the, the other uh, two uh, have the similar concept. So within the prefabricated uh, uh, construction, uh, the, the system, you have also the control box, which has to collaborate with the inner space where the users are. That's why they are user centered, taking into account their comfort and uh, health uh, conditions, plus the um, uh, operation of the renewable system, which are, in our case are uh, solar thermal photovoltaics um, that operate heat pumps. So uh, let me explain to you very briefly the smart wall. Uh, the smart wall is a prefabricated uh, uh, panel that is based on a frame, which can be made from different materials. And as you can see here, um, within the prefabrication, which has different layers of insulation of uh, framing material, we incorporate the fan coils. Somewhere here comes the toolbox for the automation, and on the outside comes the PV panel, which uh, uh, delivers the power which is needed to operate the toolbox, the control system, and drive partially uh, the operation of the heat pump, which is installed obviously due to the size outside the, uh, uh, the panel. Um, there are a lot of improvements that can be made to this uh, core concept uh, uh, in terms of, for instance, uh, storage. Uh, we can have batteries installed in between or thermal storage, um, which are future developments can be made. In the frame of the Apparel project, we have developed eight different configurations of this prefabricated uh, component uh, with windows, with balcony doors, uh, blind, uh, different thicknesses, different sizes uh, to meet the requirements of different building topologies. Um, this is uh, an indication of the installation. One of the big advantages of this type of uh, prefabricated solutions is that they can be installed very, very fast. You can see on the right of the installation that the living lab that we have at NTA, which only took 10 minutes. And uh, I mean, you can compare this to the traditional uh, construction where you have to install the wall and then do all the uh, plumping and all the electrical installations and all the uh, installation of the uh, heat pump, fan coils, and so on. So it works quite fast. The second concept is called, as I said before, Connect Wall. It is a concept that it mainly addresses uh, Central and North European climatic conditions. It's a hydronic system, an active hydronic system, very similar to the ones you know for underfloor heating, for instance. It's a piping system uh, which acts as a heating element, practically replaces the radiator. Uh, the radiator um, inside the building and transfers the heat through the mass of the existing uh, wall. Um, it's a, a, in addition, we included uh, the one you can see on the top, a decentralized ventilation and heat recovery system, which I will show you in the next slide. We have new windows with heat recovery, as um, I explained before. Uh, the photovoltaic can be also integrated uh, in the uh, prefabrication of the system, and all this comes, of course, with help of insulation. So, uh, actually, you see here a hydronic system which has to be attached very firmly to the existing wall to uh, operate via the heat pump and transfer to act as a radiator and transfer the heat to the space. Again, 
monitoring is done by the sensors that are installed inside the building and via a control box it regulates both the temperature and the operation of the heating element uh, that you see on the top. Uh, this is a view of how the system can be applied to a, a high-rise building. Uh, the, one of the challenges for this type of prefabrication is how you design the piping, uh, not to overlap, not to have spaces where you don't have any heat uh, transfer taking uh, place. And um, you can see here, for instance, uh, the uh, modularity and the heat loops that have been designed as part of the project for the installation in uh, the real demonstration building and uh, the prototypes that uh, have been tested for their stability, uh, energy performance, fire performance as part of the project. One thing that I must also uh, mention as part of this uh, prefabricated solution is the way you hang or you attach these solutions take into consideration that they include control, sensitive components, monitoring systems to the existing models, something which takes, needs a lot of attention. Um, the um, external air uh, heating and cooling system, the ventilation system that they explained before, it's a patented solution by our partner, the, uh, the Czech University, uh, CVUT. Uh, and it is uh, a solution, it's a ventilation uh, unit that combines uh, heat exchangers acting uh, both as passive and active uh, components. Uh, they, they have uh, two heat exchangers, one with a, pa a passive counter flow part and an active uh, part of uh, using thermoelectric modules uh, text. Um, they provide space ventilation and uh, they could also additionally provide uh, space heating and cooling in, in, in the case that uh, the heat supplied to the space via the hydraulic system is not uh, sufficient. Uh, the active module comprises at least one uh, heat air exchanger uh, and has two inputs and uh, two outputs to increase the flexibility of these units. These are prototype units. They are being demonstrated uh, as part of the project and uh, they are incorporated in the Connex world, which as I explained to you, uh, is being demonstrated in the Czech Republic, but also in the third solution of this project, which is called the uh, Den Comfort solution. Uh, this is a very different solution. Uh, what you see here is uh, what we call a folding facade. It's a facade that is uh, consisting of uh, elements that are linked together and they can move uh, freely. Um, it's a solution that it is developed by a, a Spanish company called uh, Develops. And as part of the project, we incorporate in this solution, in the prefabrication of the solution, the uh, external air handling and the cooling unit that I showed you before, plus the uh, windows with the heat exchange and ventilation. This solution can come on top of the existing facade, and uh, you do not need to remove the existing, uh, for instance, windows or anything else, but improve significantly, as you can understand, from the air. Uh, uh, handling uh, cooling unit and uh, uh, through the window, the, uh, the heating and cooling of the space. Uh, and uh, additionally, we are looking also for the possibility of substituting some of these uh, panels that uh, uh, make the, the folding facade with PVs. That's uh, one of the challenges. So I think I gave you a very detailed overview of the technologies. Um, what we achieved in the project it's a, a number of uh, key indicators, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, the reaching the NZ status for the buildings, uh, in comparison to what the building was before. After these interventions, that you can see that uh, for the demo sites that we have selected, all three buildings uh, fulfill the national NZ uh, standards which is very promising. The innovation costs still have to be proven because this uh, type of manufacturing is not industrialized 
uh, but uh, we have uh, um, tabulated the um, parameters that affect. Uh, the, the reduction of the time still needs to be proven because we are now entering uh, the uh, demonstration phase, but in terms of environmental impact, we use the integration of, of the active with the passive components, reduces significantly the waste material, which otherwise would have been um, on, on the demonstration, on the construction side. Um, and um, we can use also recyclable materials as part of this construction, which also uh, reduce the environmental impact. Uh, and through the studies that we did, we, can, we have established that uh, all three alternatives can reach a very high of, uh, percentage of recyclability if you combine uh, the solutions with recyclable materials. And for each of them, we have defined a number of variants that can be applied in different conditions. Now to close the presentation, uh, what are the experience uh, that uh, we obtained in terms of renewable heating and cooling? What are the advantages of prefabrication and the integration of renewable energy sources in the component and system design? Well, what we have demonstrated that uh, prefabrication can actively and efficiently integrate renewable energy uh, solutions uh, in terms of uh, um, heat generation, electricity generation, storage, management of the heat and uh, the electrical load produced, automation, uh, maps. So it is possible to do it. It needs specialized uh, skills. Um, Storage, thermal and electrical could be uh, part of the design, and this is one of the next steps that we would like to investigate. EV charging uh, could be also incorporated and be part of this prefabricated uh, solution, and if it is combined with uh, low carbon materials, of course, uh, you can end up with a decarbonized adaptive and uh, regenerative uh, solution for the built environment. Well, there are still some challenges. Each of these kits has to be designed and adapted to the building characteristics. Uh, the industrialization, as I explained, the component in the great, uh, integration as part of the manufacturing is still a challenge. It is not done uh, at a commercial and industrial level. Testing is a challenge because no regulatory framework foresees the combination of active systems with passive systems, the combination of a fan coil, for instance, in a built uh, prefabricated on the facade or the heat pump or the, uh, the PV. And acceptance, um, well, you still need to, to demonstrate these solutions for a long time before uh, there is a social acceptance and uh, um, an industrial acceptance. We, we were asked two questions. How will renewable heating and cooling uh, technically change uh, uh, in the future? We believe that uh, this type of approach, uh, creating building solutions that combine passive with active uh, systems and elements, can unlock new potentials for energy savings. Uh, a lot of ideas. Uh, if you can scale down the concepts that are applied at a district level, for instance, or uh, to a, a big building, you generate energy via a component like this, how you match it with the user requirements, the profile of the users, storing local energy. There are a lot, a lot of things that can be investigated uh, in the future. In terms of um, technologies, we all know that these are rather mature, we can see them already in uh, the market, but we need to focus on the integration and the cost reduction. Um, we need to, to standardize the components of the renewable energy systems. For instance, the piping, the valves, uh, the, uh, the controllers that are part of a heat pumps solution, for instance. 
has to be standardized so that it can be more easily integrated in the prefabricated solution. And um, the, the environmental impact of the renewable heating and cooling uh, solutions has to be improved. Uh, if I would put on a balance the, ma the material uh, solutions versus the energy solutions, the energy solutions weigh much more in terms of environmental impact than the material solutions. So there is still room for improving the environmental impact of the renewable energy heating and cooling uh, solutions. Because, as you all know, if you look at the uh, life cycle impact of a, of a building, it is the operational phase at the moment that has a, a stronger contribution. And if we reduce the environmental impact of the heating and cooling uh, systems, then uh, the overall environmental impact will be much lower. What will be the role of renewable heating and cooling uh, solutions uh, in the future? Well, uh, renewable heating and cooling systems could provide solutions, options beyond compactness, more eco-friendly materials, recyclable, reusable components, standardization of size materials to make them interchangeable. This is what I explained before as a challenge. Um, if we manage to standardize and improve the environmental impact of the renewable heating and cooling systems, as part of the prefabrication, then we can have significant cost reduction and increased market acceptance. And of course, the last, something that I say a lot of the times, the value chain is not organized at the moment. We need new business models, new ways to, to organize the value chain. I gave the example in the beginning, the heat pump producer, the pump <coughs> oil, uh, does not collaborate with the for instance, the manufacturer of a wooden facade at the moment, and they have no ways, they have no means of communicating their solutions to, to produce an integrated uh, component. And with this, I would like to thank you for the attention, and I hope I gave a different aspect of the uh, contribution of the renewable energy and nuclear uh, solutions. <laughs> No, that was perfect. Thanks. Actually, it's a, a nice approach to passive and active joint technologies. So, we have a structured the workshop to have a dedicated part for buildings and another one from more related to industry applications. But since we are good on time, maybe we will do the first presentation of the other session now and then finish afterwards. So, Moving forward. Sí, exacto, por supuesto. Porque si hago preguntas ahora. Está en la misma en la misma presentación. Sí. So, we will go now to chief prepare presentation. The presenter is here, Dimitri. Now we are changing uh, the, the area from uh, buildings to industry. Tip to fair has to do with uh, the integration of solar thermal technologies into the agrofood industry. And uh, the project uh, has been funded under Horizon 2020 and is finished its closing uh, in, uh, within uh, uh, June. Uh, so the concept is to promote and demonstrate solar thermal technologies in uh, the agrofood industry. We have three uh, different technologies that uh, have been uh, addressed in the project. The, on the top right we have the vacuum tube technology. On the left 
top and uh, bottom the high vacuum flat panel technology that is produced by uh, TVP Solar, the company I work. And uh, we have also considered the uh, linear Fresnel technology, uh, concentrated uh, uh, technology. There are 15 partners in the project. The coordination is, uh, coordinator is SIFTA. Uh, uh, solar technology providers, uh, industrial solar and PVP solar. There are quite a few R&D uh, research and uh, uh, research organizations, as well as uh, uh, representatives of the users, uh, the demo site, but also other representatives. And Burek is uh, responsible for the dissemination and training activities which we have uh, in the project. Here you see that there, uh, there were four demonstration sites initially. Uh, there are, the first one on the top has not been uh, realized and partly around the second uh, was uh, only part uh, of the solar system uh, uh, realized and then we had Martini and uh, Roda. Martini is the well-known spirit company and Roda is a winery in uh, Spain. Um, as you can see, a part of the demonstration sites, we had the application tool, which is actually a software web-based tool that helps uh, uh, non-experts to um, um, design uh, the integration of solar thermal technology in their potential uh, uh, project. It's a kind of supporting visibility of, of it. We had uh, uh, elaborated 10 feasibility studies for post-project replication. We have also several training sessions and webinar uh, during the project. And another very important uh, software uh, tool is for the senior support is the so-called control tool that actually uh, optimizes the operation of the solar systems within its specific demonstration site. Now, as I mentioned to you, the replication tool is a web-based tool that can be used by non-experts when they have a specific, for instance, industry and industrial uh, site that they would like to uh, assess which technology, which solar thermal technology can be applied, which size, if we need uh, thermal storage or not, what is the, the right temperature of operation, and so on and so forth. Some payback and uh, economic feasibility related uh, uh, aspects are also um, um, calculated but of course it's it's uh, a tool that is for an initial rough estimation of the feasibility of solar thermal so the tool has four uh, five steps general information about the, the actual site information about the solar irradiance the thermal demand then we have uh, we run some simulations for different uh, solar thermal technologies. The tool is technology agnostic, so the user can choose uh, between six, if I remember, different technologies. And the last is the integration of the solar thermal uh, into the, uh, actual processes. And the user uh, in inputs uh, information about the energy demand, the potential use of it. The fluid uh, that is used in the processes, if it's steam, hot water, sorry, hot air, water, etc., the location in space availability. Uh, now, as a whole, the, the four demo sites, the total capacity of 1.7 megawatt thermal, a solar fraction of share of 24% on average, and uh, average solar units <coughs> of 44%. Uh, on the bottom uh, right hand side, you can see some uh, figures about the energy savings that have been uh, uh, planned, targeted in the, in the project. The first demo site is uh, in Roda, in uh, a winery in, in Spain, where a small system based on vacuum tubes have been, has been installed. What is, here, also of interest for the building applications as well, is that 
uh, although we prevent, uh, the system uh, produces heat, heat is also used to uh, power an adsorption chiller and then uh, produce cold cooling uh, for the processes. This can be applied also for building applications. So to provide air conditioning through solar thermal. Now for the next uh, two uh, demonstration sites, we apply our high vacuum flat panel technology. Uh, we have produced uh, this technology, we developed this technology in TPP. Uh, we are working on, on it since 2008, the, the year that uh, TPP has been established in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And now we are uh, already uh, demonstrating this technology in 11 countries, uh, several sites. Uh, we are currently constructing a, a huge solar district heating system in the Netherlands, uh, near Groningen, uh, of a size of 37 megawatts, 48,000 of square meters of size. So the innovation in our technology is that although we are flat, uh, we use flat panel uh, uh, as a design, as an arrangement. The envelope is under high vacuum. So we minimize thermal losses and that is why we can achieve up to 200 degrees Celsius. The systems produce, that we operate, produce up to 180 degrees Celsius. We are solidly mark certified and we uh, can retain the, the high vacuum throughout the uh, lifetime of the uh, of the uh, panel, so we provide gar guarantee for 20 years, but we believe it's uh, it can hold up to 25 years or even more. The second uh, demo site, <coughs> the first with our technology, is um, a solar system of around 600 uh, square meters on the rooftop of Martin Rossi site uh, near Turin. And uh, the innovation here is that we operating dual mode. We provide space heating during the winter period and low pressure steam of 3.7 bar during the uh, summer period. Uh, here you can see different steps on the installation of the, the system. Uh, as you can see, we needed some uh, pre-construction works in preparation of the rooftop. Uh, to uh, install also some a substructure, whereas upon which our panels, our support structure of the panels would be placed. Uh, on the right uh, hand, it's the indirect steam generator that we use to produce steam. And you can see on the bottom of the solar system as it was just uh, installed. Uh, here it's a uh, it's a very simplified layout of, of how the system operates. So during the, the winter period, we uh, provide cold uh, water to two uh, 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 venting systems of Martini uh, Rossi. And during the, um, the summer period, we actually produce uh, uh, steam at 3.7 bars, as I mentioned before. Uh, the last <coughs> demonstration site is in the south of, it, of uh, France, sorry, it's in uh, La Rondi, uh site, it's a meat processing uh, plant, and the initial size was a uh, uh, plant at 1,600 square meters, one megawatt uh, of peak power, uh, that was the initial design, uh, all panels uh, were uh, uh, making a single system that generated <laughs> generate uh, heat at 175 degrees Celsius and to preheat uh, the, the boiler. But then after uh, some uh, further uh, assessment and on-site uh, surveys, we decided to split the system into two different ones, each of them uh, to provide a different uh, Temperature. So the first, the smallest one, would provide 175 degrees around this temperature, and the second one would provide uh, um, low low temperature process heat. Unfortunately, the second, although the panels were being have been installed, 
We had a major uh, hail storm, storm last uh, July, which uh, destroyed most of the panels. So we had to uh, actually uh, operate with uh, the first module along the the intensity of the of the hailstone was such a strong that uh, uh, win uh, windows from uh, cars were broken, the rooftop of the, of the factory was broken. So it was a very extreme event, unfortunately. And we could not prevent it. Every solar thermal factor, yeah. Not only in solar thermal, but also photovoltaic windows. For, for our case, it's even worse because if uh, we lose the vacuum, <laughs> and the panel cannot be used, we have to uh, replace it. So here again you can see the different stages of installing the solar system and here just the simple part again uh, uh, layout. This is where we actually integrate our system, so preheating uh, the condensate and the feedback <coughs> of, uh, of the boiler. And I'm going uh, rather fast into the control tool. It is really important, it's uh, quite technical to some extent, uh, but it's worth uh, going through it uh, to see what are the challenges in optimizing and controlling uh, a solar system that is integrated into the, into the industrial plant. So the, the control tool uh, is made of different modules. The first module, module A, focuses on the control of the solar thermal system. The second controls the actual integration into the industrial process. There is a third that is about optimizing the operation of the system as a whole, so the, the integration at plan 11. A more advanced one that uses some uh, weather forecast in order to uh, optimize the operation of the solar system, but also forecast about the production and uh, demand of heat. And some distributed learning features that uh, identify uh, uh, patterns uh, 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 that might uh, and, uh, detect let's say, faults in the operation or deviations in the operation. And the last module is just for the collection of data and the uh, uh, actual calculation of key performance indicators that we have uh, set uh, in our case. So we, we move, these modules can be applied not in every site. Uh, the sites that do not have uh, much automation they focus only on the first uh, two ones. And if there are uh, advanced control controls and uh, sensors in the, in the plant, then we can also apply the, the rest of the, uh, of the modules. Part of the, um, the control is being made locally in the, in the PLC, in the program of the logic controller. So, the control of the solar system and the integration are, are carried out locally. And then data are sent to the <coughs> server, to the web server, uh, to uh, actually perform the, the rest of the, the calculation. And of course, there is a, a front end uh, an interface for the user uh, for this purpose. Now, I'm closing the, uh, the presentation with uh, some uh, lessons learned and lesson learned and best practices. I divided them into the three uh, stages, the engineering, uh, installation, commission, and operation. For the engineering stage, what it was really a challenge, uh, particularly in the cases where there were no uh, system to collect data regarding the uh, consumption of heat. Uh, this made the, the actual uh, feasibility study and the dimensioning of the thermal system is quite of a challenge. So it's really important that the, the users collect data as early as possible. The best case, of course, is that the, the users will 
already have uh, some uh, energy management systems in place. Another major uh, uh, bottleneck is the regulatory one. In the, in the French uh, demo site, we took us almost two years to get all the, uh, the permissions for the construction works and the solar thermal system. Uh, there were uh, extra uh, safety requirements for the system in Italy for the production of steam. And uh, of course, there were some other uh, issues like language issues for the communication, etc. So what is really important as a, a best practice is to provide the data at the granularity and the quality that is required at the very beginning of the project so that we can make the best, uh, the more reliable and um, uh, correct uh, calculations at the feasibility study and to use local uh, engineering companies who uh, which uh, are aware, familiar with the local regulatory uh, requirements, uh, as well as uh, they can uh, also uh, provide support in the installation, for instance, of the, of the solar system. Now, for the civil works and installation uh, phase, uh, for us, it, there has been a, a time gap between decision making and implementation, and this in some cases changed. The, the reality, so we have to reassess uh, uh, things and make uh, new decisions. But it, will, it is uh, really also a kind of weakness this is that, uh, in contrast to photovoltaics, solar thermal is not well uh, uh, known as a technology. Uh, the users, industrial users, are not aware of, uh, of the particularities of solar thermal technology. So we need to spend time in actually educating, training uh, local uh, uh, engineers, operators, and contractors. I told you about the, the natural disaster we came upon, but we had also the pandemic, we had the supply chain disruptions. So we had quite a lot of unforeseen events and we need, it seems that we need to plan better in the future, having in mind potential uh, uh, such events. It is really important, especially I, I, think, I think that this is a, let's say, a general rule for European projects where you have different actors involved in a single uh, demonstration site. So we need to somehow clarify the roles and responsibilities, the scope of activities for each uh, actor involved. Some are partners and it's much easier to, to define these responsibilities, but some others are uh, subcontractors, local contractors, suppliers, which are not involved in the project. So we need to take uh, care about this as well. A systemic approach to training of uh, involved actors it's really important. Uh, we took this step as a, as a project and we provided webinars to all interested parties, but here at the demo site, we also need to provide training to, to all the uh, parties involved. And last thing is that um, ideally we should ensure the system against uh, natural disasters. Unfortunately for small systems, uh, I mean, for the insurance companies, this type of system, this size of systems are considered small and are reluctant to provide uh, uh, insurance. And last, for the commissioning phase, um, what we have experienced is that the commissioning phase and the troubleshooting and fine tuning takes time. It's not just a couple of weeks, it may take some months. Uh, in our case, in Martini and Rossi, where we had to uh, commission the, the steam mode, we had to wait almost one year so that we, uh, uh, we enter the summer mode operation so that we can test it again. Um, we run the system, our system close to all its capabilities, again, for steam generation. So we learn about it. We had to 
redesign part of, of our uh, components and to replace them so that it can uh, uh, operate reliably. And uh, uh, I mentioned the multi uh, party involvement and uh, coordination challenges uh, previously. So this is also important that uh, the commissioning and uh, the demonstration uh, phase using local contractors. Uh, another issue we have uh, uh, come upon was the, the actual implementation of the control uh, tool, the advanced control uh, services, because we had different partners, local contractors were dealing with uh, a control system at the, at the industrial processes. TVB has its own uh, control system for the Stellman uh, solar thermal system, and there was the control tool that were developed uh, in the project and was web-based. So we need to integrate all these tools and make uh, different uh, parts and make them uh, operate. And of course, experienced technical project managers and experienced integrators are really uh, important, valuable at this phase, from the, especially from the commissioning, but also in the previous one. So this is about the project. Thank you for your attention. And I'm hoping to Thanks a lot. Actually, it's perfect timing. Let's take 30 minutes break now, and then after we'll do with the remaining two uh, presentations, and maybe 30, 40 minutes uh, roundtable discussion. OK, let's continue. Our next presenter is uh, Anouk Muller. Yes. I hope I say it correctly. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> she works at, uh, as a research engineer at SIA. And she has her, uh, a degree. She was graduated from INSA, a Starbucks. Yes. Okay. Uh, in HVAC and renewable energy engineering. After that, uh, she had uh, first experience in sustainable buildings and joins here as a team working on absorption when she is, uh, is involved in the friendship project that she will present to us right now. That one is yours. This for passing this. Yep. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. So, uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon for the people online. I hope you can see me. So, as was just stated, I joined the Friendship Project as part of the Work Package 4, which is working especially on the absorption chiba. And today I am asked to give you a little bit of update on the Friendship Project, go through what was done in the last year. So it's a big honor for me, but a little bit of a challenge because I work in one work package and I don't have such a good overview of the whole project. So I tried to make myself clever, but if you have any question, I might also uh, forward it to people who might answer it better than me. Um, so friendship in a nutshell, what sh you should know about friendship is basically it's a project about ships, a solar heat for industrial processes it has nothing to do with boats. I'm afraid, I hope you did not expect anything linked to boats. Um, so basically it's a mix, like a system made out of a solar collector, a heat pump, thermal storage, an absorption chiller, and how everything works together, obviously. Um, two main things to remember, basically there is one first uh, concept, which goes up to 180 uh, uh, degrees which will be uh, validated in present conditions, which is a demo site, so which will be built for real, it's a prototype. There will also be a numerical validation of another version, which goes a bit higher in temperature, 300 degrees, but this will be uh, a numerical validation, so we don't build that one. Hopefully, to get a better insight, one of the first results of this year is that some videos were made, so I can actually show you Exactly this one of the ex uh, videos. I want to get some sound. Can I have some help on that? Um, 
So those videos are available online on the project's uh, website and there are other videos that I'm going to talk about uh, further in my presentation. So yes, I am asked to talk about the advances done from uh, last uh, conference. So the first one is actually that we have nice videos to show around. Uh, and then I'm going to go through the main components of the system and give you a little update. So there are those five components. So the collectors, the heat pump, the thermal storage, the control management, which uh, take care of all of that. And then I will finish with my own topic, which is the cold production and good more in detail on that one because I know a little bit more about it. So to start with the solar collectors, I don't know, I hope you can see a little bit better than me actually. Solar collectors with the selective coatings and nanoparticles to improve heat transfers. So what is the status now? Basically it's finished, um, the new selective coating to be used for the solar field on the demonstration while well, it's done. There were some deliverables uh, written and delivered and also papers on it. And there is also a video, a special video made for it that I recommend you go and check online on this website I was showing you. The next topic would be the very high temperature heat pump, which uh, that enables continuous and stable heat, heat supply at target temperatures between 180 to 150 degrees. So the status of it is there is a prototype uh, commissioned and uh, at same time in Norway, the test campaign is going on. There was a little bit of delay take, uh, because key personnel was missing uh, this winter. But anyway, they were able to also write a deliverable and they are exactly like starting to test. So once again, the same video as before. Then we come to the thermal storage. Uh, so exactly, it allows the storage of heat from the solar heat loop as well as from the process loop, so both directions. The status in that, uh, on that component is that there is also manufacturing, uh, uh, a prototype being manufactured. 
Uh, this is ongoing. The test campaign didn't start yet, but we hope that it will be starting uh, in the next month. They are also writing uh, everything that we're working on on daily deliverables, obviously, and work on dissemination. And we have another video which uh, describes all of that a little bit more in detail. Then, obviously, this is one of the key challenges of the project that we need a smart control management uh, for having all of those components working together nicely. Uh, the status of this part of the project is that it's ongoing, like everything, their modeling is ongoing uh, with the Modelica uh, language. Paper was written as well, and there is some active dissemination on that topic as well. And now we come to my favorite topic. Uh, so we've been writing, uh, working on absorption chillers, also ejector eject chiller, but that was on the part of Syntef, so I was not implied in it too much. Nevertheless, they also write some nice deliverable to so uh, 4.2. Uh, and what happened on the chiller side, uh, like for the last year, is that there was work done on trying to determine which would be the best architecture. Uh, for reaching those minus 20 temperatures. Then there was a selection of the best architecture, so based uh, on simulations, obviously. And then the design was made, so to go from what happens in theory and simulation to how do we build a prototype which will be able to join the complete prototype uh, of the whole ship system. Uh, exactly, so there was a design, there was a manufacturing, a lot of papers, uh, two papers again, and dissemination. And I can show you how it looks like, because it happened really. So this is our prototype. Uh, it looks like it's not much, but it's actually very uh, complex to build. There is uh, eight uh, heat exchangers. There are several bottles as well. And the key feature is that there is ammonia in it and uh, a lot of pressure, or not so much, but Ammonia is toxic, and there is one thing you don't want to happen is to having kind of leakages. So there was a lot of uh, care given to the prototype building, obviously, and very careful air tightness and pressure tests that happened all last uh, last August. And this is how it was looking like when I joined the project. So the prototype is here, uh, and. What you can see over there is that uh, their ventilation is ready to start it. There would be any leakage, obviously. We don't want any ammonia accident happening. It's also well protected uh, with glass doors. And here, so we have this test bench. What does it do? This is where it becomes uh, interesting and funny to test out because we're out of the simulation. It's real life. So I said we have eight heat exchangers. Four of them are external heat exchangers. The four last ones are internal, so more like uh, internal uh, heat, um, like savings, I would say, to keep it simple. But so we have four externals, and it, we're working with three different levels of temperature, so those are the conditions. So two heat exchangers are working with similar temperatures, so only three levels of temperature. And we want to be able to simulate all possible conditions, so all possible, uh, the, it is likely that the system is going to work with. And for that, we have those modules, which are allowing a lot of flexibility, meaning that I can decide to test my system for 100 degrees or 110 or 110 to 20 or 160. I can have a different kind of um, ramps up or uh, curves, and I can simulate a lot of different uh, situations. So this would be one of the very, like the main results uh, we come we came with. So we make all those tests. What are all those tests? It's first and the like steady state points, obviously. What we want to show here is uh, how does the prototype work when we try to reach a lower temperature, because the point of the chiller is obviously to chill. So we want to reach minus 20 degrees. And how well does it work? In that case, for minus 20 degrees, we could get six kilowatt uh, power output, and what is the COP, so actually the efficiency uh, at minus 20 
we see that here is electrical, it's 35 around, and the thermal is a little bit lower than uh, 0.4. On the other hand, if we want to work with slightly easier temperatures, so minus 5, for example, we get a much better power output and also better CUP, whether it's thermal or electrical. Uh, exactly. So this is, as I said, one example, and those curves are working with those specific conditions, but the setting allows us to actually check many different um, yeah, conditions. This, those are different um, tests that we could do uh, on those prototypes. So that would be an example for startup, startup to see how well the dynamics work. It's very important for real life uh, situations to know if the machine is going to react fast enough to any change of loads, uh, or how do we do we need half a day to get the machine started? In that case, uh, the two curves are showing fairly different conditions. One is so it's not exactly the same temperatures we're working on. That was just the test around, and also the main pump is having a ramps with different speeds. So we wanted to check if there is a big difference depending on how we ramp up the system. So it was ramping up for around 20 minutes uh, for the blue one and a little bit less for the red one. And what we could see is that it doesn't make such a big difference. Like the, the red one is a little bit steeper up there, but in the end, we reached our minus 20 degrees, what we wanted to in around the same time. So yeah, we're fairly stable after 30 minutes. It doesn't make much sense to go always slower to try to keep the system very stable. It doesn't change so much. Um, this was a completely different test. I wanted to illustrate how we had to tune up the system because that's also one issue when we work in simulation and then come for a real prototype. There are tons of little things that we need to tune up to find good uh, working conditions. In that case, it was the rectification temperature. So try to explain very fast what it means. Um, in this machine, we try to separate ammonia from water with boiling it. So normally if you heat up at actually this uh, 120 degrees, you will have ammonia uh, turning into vapor and hopefully water not up fact is it doesn't work so well and you need to cool it again to make the water condensate and clean ammonia from water. There is a question of efficiency coming in that. Do you want to um, cool down the system a lot and then get super pure ammonia but then you lose a lot of heat by doing that or can you tolerate some water and it, without it impacting the efficiency of the whole machine too much? So it's all a question of finding the good purity uh, which is a uh, good um, Compromise, let's say. And in that case, we could do that very well with the prototype, check different temperatures, so different uh, settings, check how it impacts indirectly the COP, and determine, okay, we're good with the COP, which is over there, most, mostly, so we see mixed curves, and this is bringing us to something about 75 degrees. And now we get the answer, how do we set our system? So this is one illustration of the kind of work we were doing this winter. Last but not least, one of the targets we were having in this work package was to have a strong model of the system. So we had a model which was developed during design. As I said, we had to choose an architecture that was done through models and also for the preliminary performance simulation. So we had something, but then we had to confront what happens in real life. And uh, whoever worked with prototypes know that there is a gap between what you expected and what uh, comes out. And what we did was we worked on the models, especially on efficiencies, to try to understand what was going on and where uh, our targets were not met, what uh, expectations we were having, which, was a, which were a little bit too optimistic. Um, this is uh, one of the outcome. So what you see here is basically um, yeah, comparing for every three sets of temperatures, what the model uh, gives out and what the experiments gave out. So ideally, if the models were was very good, we would be on the one-to-one -one line. Happens that we're not that good, 
there is, we're not that far either, that's a good relief, but there is some work to be done on the model. Uh, and there is probably also possibilities for improving the machine because now we could uh, also spot out where the efficiencies seem to be very, um, like, let's say, room for improvement at least. So one of the output uh, was that the plate heat exchangers were providing satisfying heat transfers, but we're having issues with species mass transfers, especially the absorber and the generator. So this is somewhere where we know that we need to work uh, on a little bit more and future investigations to be done. So thank you for, for your attention. Uh, I'm available for talking about the chiller anytime. And yeah, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Save the question for Very good. So now we have our final presentation of the day. Yeah, so uh, a little bit about you. Uh, Alexia holds a master's degree in buildings and engineering from the University of Brescia. Uh, since 2019, she has been working on the fields of sustainability and energy efficiency in buildings and the urban environment. And she's also working as a uh, project manager in Rina, uh, where she's managing different EU projects. Uh, among them, the one she's going to present now, the Great Senate. The floor is yours. Okay, so thank you so much, David, for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and present a uh, uh, Senate project uh, in uh, this work. Workshop. So, uh, what is Zenith in a nutshell? So, uh, Zenith stands for Zero Waste Heat Vessel Towards Relevant Energy Savings, also thanks to IT technologies. So, it basically deals with uh, um, vessels, uh, waste heat recovery, and IT technologies. And uh, is a research and innovation action that is uh, uh, funded uh, within Cluster 5 and Destination 4. It's, it's quite a recent project. project. Uh, currently, we are in month 13. Uh, it started in uh, June 2022, and uh, it will uh, last three and a half, and it will end uh, uh, in November 2025. So uh, there are uh, 11 partners uh, from seven different countries, and the project is about four and a half million funds. So here you, you can see uh, the consortium uh, in our first general assembly in uh, Athens and uh, how uh, the different partners are uh, distributed in Europe. So we can say that the consortium in general is quite uh, well represented. We have uh, different uh, research uh, centers and the universities that are part of the consortium. So for example, we have TNR, uh, Technalia, and um, the National, National Technical University of Athens as a researchers. We have uh, uh, some technolo technology providers, some, uh, uh, such as Schema, Search and Technologies, Bank for Blue, uh, Sigla, and Enquartech. And uh, we have also, uh, uh, let's say, Naval Sector Representatives, which is ANEC. And uh, as, as, uh, we, as David was saying, I represent Lina Consulting, and uh, we are the coordinators of uh, this project. And uh, in particular, it's not just uh, Rina, Consult Rina Consulting with the coordinator, but also our affiliated entities, which is Rina Services, is part of the project, which is, uh, let's say, the branch of Rina that is uh, uh, working on the naval and shipping sector. So why we are working on Zenith? Uh, um, the International Marine, Marine Organization uh, has uh, uh, set goals. Uh, really ambition goals indeed uh, they want to uh, reach the decarbonization uh, they want to reduce the emission connected to the shipping sector by at least uh, 50 percent by 2025 uh, 2050 sorry and moreover also the uh, european commission is uh, uh, even raising this target indeed they are willing to um, let's say uh, reach the reduce the emission connected to the transport by at least uh, 90 percent so, uh, as I was saying, those goals are real ambitions, and to try to reach them, we need to involve stakeholders, of course, related to the, um, in this case, uh, 
the vessel sector, the shipping sectors, and uh, uh, we think that uh, in this particular case, uh, since on board uh, the vessel, um, since in the vessels there are a lot of uh, waste heat, uh, that usually is, uh, is wasted and not used. Uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, recover this type, this, uh, type of source uh, can be really uh, can can be a key solutions in uh, reaching the target that uh, that uh, we want to reach by uh, 2050. So here is a uh, zenith ambition, and what we are willing uh, to do is to develop and validate and validate uh, solution wasted wasted to X solutions. So uh, solutions that take the waste it and transform it in another type of source that can be used on board. Uh, in a rapid market rollout so that the solution can be ready to be implemented by 2030 uh, directly on board. So, and uh, as the solution should be key technologies, as we're saying, to reach the decarbonization target, uh, uh, well, hopefully by 2030, but before, let's say, 2030. So uh, the, the solution should be uh, ready to scale up. And uh, so far, I have talked about uh, wasted to X solutions. So, uh, of course, those wasted to X solutions are, let's say, the core of the project. It's uh, the solution that we are developing, but we are also developing other important solutions that will be coupled with uh, those uh, wasted to X uh, uh, recovery systems. And uh, in particular, those solutions will be an alternative propulsion system that will serve to save. Uh, uh, carbon on boards, uh, fuel on boards, uh, and uh, uh, a thermal uh, energy storage, of course, and uh, uh, some uh, IT technologies uh, for controlling all the systems that should be connecting and working together on board, and of course for monitoring also the solution in order to uh, save some energy, let's say. So. Here are uh, the fundamentals of uh, uh, this project, I've talked about uh, some of them before, but uh, to go more into detail, uh, the idea will, is uh, to develop these three waste heat to X solutions that will be able to exploit uh, the waste heat at different sources in order to try to, uh, let's say, catch a wide range of temperature uh, that we can uh, save on board. And uh, in particular, we will have uh, uh, an uh, isobaric expansion engine that uh, will be able to produce uh, to uh, from waste heat to produce mechanical work, and uh, that will work uh, with temperature under uh, 100 degrees. We are developing an absorption system, weight heat, weight, waste heat to cooling and desalination, that will be able to produce uh, potable water on board and uh, cooling, and that will work uh, uh, within temperature from 70 to degrees to 100 degrees, and uh, an innovative organic ranking cycle integrated with uh, heat pump with a ejection uh, system that will be able to produce uh, regeneration, so power, uh, heating, and, uh, and cooling. And uh, yes, and as we said, those systems will be coupled. Uh, the idea will be that those systems can be coupled on board in order to, uh, let's say, uh, use a wide range of temperature. Uh, of the waste heat. So here, yes, we have just a graphical configuration of what I've just shown you before. And uh, to tell you something more about uh, our approach, we can say that our approach is divided in uh, four main phases. So, so far there are two, the first two phases that are running in parallel and uh, are the vessel energy and the waste heat audit and modeling, uh, which is uh, focusing on analyzing what is the current state on board in order to understand what are the sources that we can then exploit and uh, use with uh, the different solutions. And besides this, uh, we are also uh, developing some models uh, and approaches uh, from as a, such as thermodynamics, uh, dynamics, uh, and uh, also energy efficiency analysis uh, to assess uh, uh, what is the potential, uh, um, the energy and thermal needs on board. Uh, then those, those uh, data that we are uh, we have analyzed in the first part, part of the project uh, are in parallel used uh, as the, an input from uh, the, technolo the technology provider, which are uh, in the first 18 uh, months of the project are developing the solution, those are wasted to its uh, solution, as not just the wasted to its solution, as I was saying, but for example, also the thermal energy storage that will be coupled with them on board. 
and uh, starting from uh, uh, the analysis performed on the um, available sources on board, they have, uh, let's say, uh, tailored also the prototypes they are, they are developing. Um, the second phase will, will end uh, in six months, so in month uh, 18, and after this phase, uh, it will start the validation campaign that will take place uh, at two levels in the lab, in uh, lab level in Technalia lab, laboratory, and then uh, on a, a vessel. And after uh, those solutions will be uh, validated, uh, the idea will be to uh, really focus on the replication, because uh, as I was saying before, uh, we want this solution to be easily replicated and uh, ready for the market uh, to be directly implemented. So there is a big, we are really working hard on uh, everything that is connected to, yes, the exploitation of the results, but uh, as well as uh, the business model is related to the, those results, the cost benefit analysis and uh, life cycle analysis and so on, to really try to understand how we can uh, create uh, the optimal system. So about the validation campaign, as we said, there will be two validation that we all run in parallel. So uh, all the systems will be uh, validated together in the Technalia lab. So what, all the systems, but uh, the propulsion system that of course cannot be tested in the Technalia lab, but the uh, thermal energy storage and uh, the three waste to x systems, as well as the uh, digital platform, will be all connected together in order to understand which is the best configuration and try to make uh, the solution work together efficiently. And uh, uh, besides this, uh, this those, like one solution will be also <laughs> tested on board, not all the three of them, but just the absorption uh, system chiller, which is uh, developed uh, by um, uh, CNRE Econtech. Uh, it will be installed on board on this vessel, which is a, a vessel that uh, is uh, a private vessel used by artists, and uh, is a vessel that uh, those artists uh, use as they, their home. So they are traveling, or well, they should travel around Europe to perform uh, to in cultural uh, activities and uh, ex exhibitions. So the idea will be to install uh, this uh, absorption chiller that to provide cooling and, of course, um, uh, potable water and then to couple this with uh, the wing sail that is already installed in this uh, vessel and uh, with the digital solution we are developing. So uh, the idea will be to uh, demonstrate those solution uh, in order to reach by the end of the Zenith project uh, at world it is about uh, five, six. So there will be still room and space for improving them, but we, we, we are sure that we will uh, be able to improve them after the Zenith project and in just a few years uh, we will be able to reach a higher TRL uh, so that the solution can be directly uh, be ready to implement it in the market by 2030. So the general goal is to reach uh, an overall reduction of the energy performance of uh, the vessel uh, up to uh, 25 uh, uh, which is a really ambitious goal. So talking more about the technologies uh, we are developing, uh, we are following, uh, let's say, the uh, three different phases. So we started with the system modeling, so just to understand which is the best configuration and how the different input and uh, the related output uh, are connected. And then uh, we also, uh, uh, perform a deeply analysis about uh, the material definition. So we identified and tested different materials to understand which is the best material to reach uh, the goal we are setting. And so far we have, uh, we are done with the first two phases. So we are now in the first, uh, the third phases in which we are proceeding with uh, the detailed design of uh, the solution, which will end in, as we say, in six months so that we can start with uh, the uh, testing campaign. So this, is, this was just an overview about uh, the project in general. And uh, now I would like to talk a bit more about the solutions that are connected you know, to cooling and heating, so uh, to uh, the, this uh, uh, workshop topic. So uh, the solution uh, that will provide uh, cooling and heating services are the absorption system, which, as we're saying, 
will be able to provide uh, um, um, desalinated water and uh, cooling uh, uh, services, uh, as well as the organic price cycle, uh, ranking cycle uh, system that will be able to uh, provide uh, power, heating, and, uh, and cooling. So uh, about the absorption system, it is uh, uh, composed by uh, three main, uh, let's say, um, uh, parts. So there, will, there, there is a reactor filled with solvents, an evaporator, and a condenser. So uh, this system will be able to produce uh, uh, salination water thanks uh, to a process. So the idea will be to extract uh, the uh, vapor from uh, water uh, into the sorbents uh, during the sorption process, and then to uh, make it, that, it uh, let, let's say, back to liquid uh, uh, state, thanks to this, uh, let's say, to the condenser uh, and uh, the condensation process. So the, this machine will be able to perform both uh, cooling and uh, desalination system at the same time. And uh, um, it can be uh, implemented in uh, different uh, types of vessel. And as we said, this will be the, the system that will be uh, implemented and tested also on the vessel, while the other ones will be just tested in uh, the lab scale. So we can say that this is the more uh, advanced one from uh, this point of view. And uh, the idea will be to, uh, of course, uh, we, thanks to this sensor system, we, we will be able to save uh, electricity uh, that is usually uh, used for uh, cooling production and uh, desalination uh, and potable water production, production on board. And the idea will be to save at least 30% uh, compared to the uh, standard, let's say, case. And uh, here you have some uh, overview about the technical details, but the idea will be to have a COP about 0607 and uh, two prototypes will be uh, developed within uh, the project because as we're saying this system will be tested in both lab scale and uh, on board. Uh, we have already uh, realized a first draft of prototype and uh, it's already in the lab. We, we just arrived in the CNR uh, lab and now we will use this prototype to fine tune the, uh, this, uh, let's say, third phase with the detailed design of this uh, uh, engine. So about the, uh, the other system uh, we are using, uh, as I was saying, is a, a three-generation unit, so uh, that is able to provide three types of uh, power, and uh, it can uh, reach uh, quite a high range of uh, uh, exit uh, uh, temperature levels, so it can recover medium high, uh, so even over uh, 100 degrees uh, uh, waste heat temperature, but also about uh, 60 uh, degrees uh, uh, waste heat temperature. So the innovative idea is to couple this system, so uh, an organic cycling cycle, with uh, 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 ejection cooling, cycle, heat, cooling cycle, cycle heat pump uh, system <laughs> uh, in a cascade in order to uh, have a different configuration. And uh, in this way, as I was saying, we will try to reach a wide range of uh, waste heat uh, uh, temperature level. And uh, uh, we, are, we, we think that uh, with this system, we will be able to reach about 12% uh, of uh, efficiency on, uh, the, on the energy consumption, let's say. So, uh, so far, we have identified four different uh, configuration and scenario for this system. And uh, uh, we, we can have just electricity production. We can have uh, uh, both electric electricity and heating production. We can have electricity and cooling production, or we can just have uh, cooling production. So this was a, a brief and general overview. So uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out or uh, raise your hand. I would like to ask for the presenters to lower in the picture. We were missing Alexia in the description. No, no. Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, we can also take a picture with the It would be good for you, but. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank several technologies to industry and even to chips. So it was a very interesting <laughs> workshop. Uh, well, the first, I would like to ask if somebody in the audience, even in the online audience, want to have any question. It's good then. I have a few uh, general questions to, to pick up uh, uh, discussion or conversation. The first of it is, after having all this rich interchange, do you think that we have the technologies that we need in order to make an efficient and affordable transition to greener energy systems? Or we need to invest more money in R&D to, to make it feasible? I don't know. It's from your point of view, not really from the... Well, there are some uh, reports, some analysis from international organizations that uh, claim that uh, to some extent, at least to a great extent, the technologies are there. Uh -huh. Of course, we have to reduce costs to make them to scale them up. But on the other hand, there are uh, some missing links for the full transition, uh, which are related, for instance, to the storage. And storage is uh, an issue taking into consideration the uh, intermittence of uh, renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are emerging technologies like uh, uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, that need uh, more uh, research and development. From my perspective, from my company's perspective, for solar thermal, we believe that for the low uh, temperature and medium temperature um, range of, uh, uh, of applications, both in industry but also in, uh, um, in buildings, the technologies are there. It's a matter of scaling them up in, in order to uh, also achieve economies of scale. It's a matter of investment, uh, and funding. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, level playing uh, field, for sure, compared to other uh, alternative, either renewables or fossil-based uh, technologies. And integration with other interesting uh, technologies like heat pumps is something we could work at integration actions, not pure LED, I would say. Mm -hmm. Although there is a part of uh, of high temperature uh, heat pumps that needs to be uh, further researched, at least in my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, we listened today about Sintef's uh, uh, prototyping of, uh, of a heat pump that goes up to 200, 150 degrees. So this is something that needs to be uh, researched further. Uh, thermal storage, to come back again to uh, technologies that are related to solar thermal storage, it's something that uh, needs to be further researched. Today we have the solutions for low temperature thermal storage uh, based on uh, hot water, mm -hmm. so below 100 degrees, but there is a gap above 100 degrees where 
we can uh, make uh, health solutions to uh, pressurize cold water up to a certain uh, level, but then the, the cost gets uh, higher. And um, the PCMs, uh, it's in materials, are still quite expensive. So we need to also to, to address uh, this kind of issues. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's also a matter of the industry, for instance, to take some decisions and change the way that their uh, thermal energy systems operate. So today, most of them are based on uh, boilers, the centralized uh, uh, steam network which distributes the steam to different uh, processes that run typically at lower uh, temperatures. So by using the solar thermal, we need to change this way of thinking and try to make the best out of solar thermal. That means that we need to integrate directly to the uh, uh, in industrial processes so at lower temperatures. Well, that's from my side. I think I spoke too much. Everyone wanted to add something. That was really great. So I can add something from uh, let's say the second of you. So uh, I think that uh, of course uh, uh, we need to uh, for some solution as we were suggesting. You, you, we need to keep you know researching uh, because there are solutions that uh, are have still a high potential. Uh, let's say uh, unknown. So. We keep. Uh, we have to keep working on this. But for example, uh, talking about the Zenith project, uh, the solution we are developing and uh, we are trying to uh, test on the vessel are solutions that are already well known and used on the terrestrial, let's say, terrestrial uh, application. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in this case, uh, I think that it's really more important to focus and. Well, during my presentation, I focused on the technologies because I wanted, I wanted to show you which are the technologies that we are working on. But I think it's really important uh, to work on also on the, let's say, regulatory, the, like from the yes, regulatory, thank you, uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this sense, we'll be working with uh, the regulatory body, bodies because it's really important not just to, let's say, develop solutions but to understand how we can integrate maybe solutions that we have already studied in our, in other contexts uh, yeah. within this specific yes exactly yeah. so. uh, and in your opinion which is the main gap that we have right now in from your project perspective for the uptake of the technologies that we are developing in the projects? because what we have seen in the last years is that well, the last 20 years is that a lot of thermal energy storage technology has been developed, but they don't reach market. They stagnate in a point where they stay there and then you go for the next project and it's the same. You just... Now, the main reason is because there is no demand for, for that, at least until and why? now. And why? Because, for instance, speaking from solar thermal perspective, uh, solar thermal is wi uh, widely known and applied at uh, household uh, uh, level, but not at uh, industrial scale. Mm -hmm. So. The, the industrial scale market is uh, actually growing. Uh, the last year we had a, a, a really significant uh, growth in terms of the size of the project, but also uh, overall. Uh, so still, um, solar heat for industrial processes is a national market, it's not a mature market. So we are seeing that we will need in the future, in the close short term, uh, thermal storage technologies to couple uh, solar heat so that we can uh, meet a much higher share of uh, solar heat, of carbon free heat, mm -hmm. uh, to the overall mix of uh, industries. Uh, but the market is still not uh, here today. So it's something that will come. The, the more that the policy makers and the users they push for uh, uh, carbon-free uh, energy technologies, the, the market will expand and then uh, the also thermal storage technologies will make sense from a commercial perspective and not just for innovation actions and demonstration purposes. And they will also need some regulatory framework to enhance the I think that, for instance, um, 
in the innovation fund, mm -hmm. it's a huge uh, funding program, can uh, support the funding of 60%, some major large scale uh, projects that will involve both, for instance, solar thermal, thermal storage, maybe also coupled with uh, heat pumps. So that kind of uh, combinations of technologies uh, can help, and of course, with funding, we can uh, open a new market. Uh, yeah. I have a kind of like a dedicated question for you, Juan. Uh, your project is one of the ones switching then. Yeah. As a project, do you have any uh, plan for continue to finance the, this type of uh, idea? Maybe a cascade funding or, or a um, actually, no. Uh, so basically, the project was uh, ambition for what he's doing right now. Basically, setting up all these um, structures and methodologies for the, the um, energy planners to be able to go from the idea of a concept of I want to implement more renewable energy sources to, to having a final project. But now there are uh, actually the um, financial studies, which is uh, the last part of, of the project. Um, it's being a little bit hard to to basically encompass because most of these projects are still really um, something on the planning stage and not really um, they haven't contacted anyone yet or, or any escorts or whatever. So in the end, it's uh, pretty hard to to get it to materialize. Um, also, something that I want to add is that um, for the local authorities, uh, what we've seen is that they are actually lacking a lot of resources. Um, mostly throughout Europe because our project covers um, yeah, multiple countries and from their standpoint the, the thing is that they don't even have time to learn to use these kind of tools even if we are supporting them. So in the end I think that um, going back to your last question, um, one of the issues of the uptake of these technologies that is really important is that in the end the, the people that need to use them, uh, for example on the public side, don't have any time to learn new methodologies um, and then on the private side until uh, a few years ago uh, fossil fuels were always way cheaper so and, and you already have the technology implemented so why would I change my system to a more efficient one if mine is even cheaper and we're not even sure if uh, you take out the subsidies if this technology would be um, yeah, self-sustained uh, economically. I step in here because I also have a question for you. Um, actually, it's two questions. One is, I was wondering, I may have understood wrong from the presentation, are you supposed to uh, deliver 120 uh, consultancies? Yeah. To, and, and I was really wondering, methodologically speaking, how can you manage in a, in a new project with the Typical budget, I suppose, or maybe it's a much higher budget. Uh, no, no, it's it's actually not not a high budget. Um, the thing is that that support really light to say so. So what we did is try to get to more people uh, instead of have a more tailored support, which is what we did in the previous project. Um, so basically, what we do is, uh, I was discussing during the break. Um, we provide support. We are not able to carry out any tasks. So. For example, on my side, I'm more focused on the previsibility studies, but I'll meet with, uh, yeah, with the applicants or the participants rather um, a couple of times a month and see how their progress is going. If they have any any issues or whatever, we'll uh, go in and try to fix them. But that's uh, not the usual. And same thing happens with the uh, with the other. So, for example, it's actually uh, 120 municipalities to be supported. So, for example. If we uh, have a, a webinar, for example, for an energy agency and they bring 20 municipalities, we would consider that it's support provided to those 20 municipalities. So that's why maybe the KPI is a little bit high. But also, um, yeah, for these municipalities, we are uh, also having um, group webinars and so on. So that's the way that we try to reach out to as many people as possible. Okay, so you're getting in touch with municipalities which already have an energy planning process in, in, in place. Could or could not. Uh, they could have it or they could not have it. Depends on the needs of the municipality. Actually, the uh, application process, you have this um, application form that we have <coughs> on the website, but then uh, we carry out uh, what we call a ramp up session uh, with each applicant to understand better the, their case study, how we could help them, and how it could fit 
uh, within the support facility. Okay, and the, thank you. And the uh, second part of the question is related to district heating, which uh, belongs to a very I was checking this morning. I was wondering, uh, given this old, nice overview you have uh, on municipalities, uh, how many, uh, okay, I don't want to figure, but do many uh, or are many thinking of uh, district heating and cooling which they don't have, so I'm talking about new networks, or is this something which is quite far from uh, from the all day, day by day thinking of well, usually it's something that most municipalities are considering because uh, actually it's a pretty easy case study. Um, usually what we, you uh, face when you're developing a district heating network is the, the demand is not assured. Um, so even when you are uh, modelizing or, or developing the, the plans for it, um, it's really hard to design it if, you're not even, if you don't even know if a certain building is going to be included. Um, so yeah, basically with municipalities, it's really easy to kick off these kind of things because they can take all the public buildings within the, the, the network and then build upon that. Um, municipalities throughout Europe, most of the, of the case studies, as you said, as you saw, the, the application is open to anyone, basically. Uh, but we get most applications from municipalities which are really interested in district heating. I think okay. it's really pushing okay. throughout Europe. Perfect. I have one more question this one for you, Maria. We were discussing a bit about it in the break, but maybe you can go a bit deeper. Uh, uh, you were saying that one of the biggest uh, let's say, points of, to have in mind with your system are the fire safety reasons. Can you elaborate a bit more on it? Well, uh, what I said is that uh, this type of uh, combined hybrid uh, building components that combine passive with active uh, systems uh, need to be tested in terms of their fire safety, structural, uh, uh, steady and dynamic, static and dynamic structural uh, performance, especially in countries with uh, seismic uh, conditions. Uh, and the last but not least, sound, because when you incorporate uh, and coil a pumping system, or you need to take into account some. And there are no specifications, there are no uh, standards, or even in the front frame of any water, uh, there is no regulatory framework for uh, the certification and the market penetration of such systems. Perfect, thank you. So if somebody has any other question, Otherwise, we finish. Thank you all for, for participating and congratulations for such a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you.